Va bene, allora direi cominciamo. Eh, questo colloquio è dedicato alla supersimmetria. Ci sarà una parte teorica e una parte sperimentale. Mi hanno detto che verranno intervallate diciamo, una parte iniziale teorica, sperimentale teorica. Il, eh, per, visto che è stato chiesto eh, per il, quanto riguarda la lingua parleremo in inglese, quindi io adesso passo all'inglese. So, it is this colloquium is about supersymmetry, there is first a theoretical part, then an experimental part, then a reina theoretical part. And the first speaker is uh, Gianfrancesco Giudice. Uh, he got his uh, laurea degree in Padua, so in, in view of his uh, brilliant career, it should be considered as one of the glory of the high energy physics in Padua. Then he got his PhD at CISA, then he went to uh, first Fermilab, then uh, It, in in uh, Austin, in Texas, uh, in the group of the Nobel Prize, uh, Steven Weinberg, then he moved to CERN, where he is now presently. He works on uh, many subjects, mainly supersymmetry, uh, dark matter, extra dimensions, uh, universe, uh, primordial universum, and uh, uh, He also is uh, very good uh, uh, in popularizing uh, the science. I also heard some of his very nice talk in some uh, very uh, broad audience. So uh, he will now combine all these abilities. So his uh, ability about supersymmetry, the fact that he's at LAC, and the fact that he's uh, uh, very good in popularizing scientific uh, research, as uh, for example in his uh, book uh, on Theptospace, uh, which is an introduction to the physics of LHC. And now exactly this big scene will come out in this uh, search for uh, uh, searching supersymmetry at the LHC. So please. Thank you very much. Um. So it's uh, certainly for me, it's a special, very special emotion to, to talk uh, in this room, uh, which brings up many very nice memories of a uh, long time past. Uh, I, my, my role here will be just to introduce uh, Gigi, who will talk about the result of LHC. I just want to give you uh, just a quick uh, uh, introduction about supersymmetry or where we stand. And then I give some uh, conclusions, some personal conclusions of what we learn from the results that uh, Gigi will present. Uh, so supersymmetry, the, the history of uh, supersymmetry is very curious, as essentially all its aspects uh, have always been uh, uh, strange. For instance, so supersymmetry came in the, in the scene uh, of, uh, of particle physics in the early 70s. And uh, it, in, a, in a way that was discovered and rediscovered several times. And it's, it's a curiosity that uh, the first time was discovered not in the context of uh, quantum field theory, but in the context of string theory. And in 71, uh, uh, Ramon and uh, Neve Schwartz afterward, sorry, uh, and, uh, uh, and Neve Schwartz afterwards. Uh, uh, Apply, discover the structure of supersymmetry in the context of string theory, which was uh, the theory that was supposed to describe uh, uh, hadronic physics. Uh, soon after, supersymmetry was rediscovered. Uh, those were the good old days, so were discovered in the Soviet Union, but uh, left uh, hidden uh, behind uh, the Iron Curtain, and uh, not very much known to the, to the uh, Western community. The final rediscovery of supersymmetry happened in, in 73 with uh, Vest and Zubino, who gave the formulation of supersymmetry that now we study, all of us study it uh, at school. Uh, it took some time to understand what was behind the formalism, because it really started as a rather formal branch of, uh, of field theory. But then uh, it was uh, uh, quickly understood 
that supersymmetry had uh, something was really a revolution in concept. It was not just a model with some new particles. It's really, it's really a formidable new concept because it modifies the whole structure of space-time. So in a sense, continues the process that started with Einstein. The big revolution of Einstein was to understand, essentially, that uh, the, the, the arena in which uh, physical phenomena take place is not just simply uh, uh, three-dimensional space, but what you need is a description in terms of four-dimensional space-time. And uh, four-dimensional space-time, which is described, this is, comes from the symmetry. Like three-dimensional space, in a sense, is defined by uh, rotation and translation. Once you want to have a larger symmetry uh, for, uh, for your uh, dynamical equation and you want to include the Poincaré group, then the natural entity in which you uh, can formulate your physical laws is four-dimensional space-time. And this is special relativity. And then Einstein went on uh, to give a, a dynamical interpretation of space-time that became uh, general relativity. Supersymmetry, in a sense, pushes this program even further by considering enlarging the uh, 4D structure of space-time into a space-time with more dimension, which is what we call superspace. But the real novelty is that these new dimensions are described by coordinates uh, given by some new kind of numbers. They're just not normally numbers, but they are Grassmannian numbers, so anti-commuting uh, uh, entities. So that I cannot even uh, uh, draw uh, a picture, a geometrical picture of this, but the important thing is that there is a consistent mathematical formulation of the idea, and clearly there is a new ge geometry behind it, which is superspace, and a new algebraic structure in the formulation of supersymmetry. The, uh, the basic thing comes from the fact that these new coordinates are anti-commuting objects. So if they are anti-commuting, obviously its square has to be zero. And uh, then if you consider now a field in superspace. So superspace is described by, uh, is there a pointer? Or? But it's not, it's not so crucial. Uh, it's described in terms of the coordinate x. We describe four-dimensional space-time. And, uh, and I got it, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and then the new coordinates, which are anti-commuting variables. Now, in full generality, you can do a Taylor expansion with infinite powers of these new coordinates, but now comes the, uh, the algebraic property that anti-commuting variables have that are such that the square is equal to zero, meaning that this is an exact equation, it's not a truncation, that the full series actually is described in terms of only two coefficients that depends on, on space-time coordinates, and this you can interpret as ordinary uh, uh, fields, as ordinary particles. So the picture is that because of, uh, of this equation, because of the anti-commuting nature of these new coordinates, you, when you project an entity, let's say a particle, from superspace and you project it onto four-dimensional space-time, then you get a double shadow, a double entity, which are the two particles which are described by the same object that exists in superspace. Um, this is uh, clearly uh, reminiscent of what happens in the case of matter-antimatter. Right? When, when Dirac tried to unify special relativity with uh, quantum mechanics, he found out that the equation naturally, automatically, was giving rise to a doubling of the states. And he, could, he tried, actually, to get rid of the second state, but it was impossible. The equations were forbidding that. And this is now interpreted, has been discovered, and we interpret it as, as antimatter. And we know that matter and antimatter are not two distinct particles, but actually are the same entity. Mathematically, we describe it by the same entity. Same thing here for uh, supersymmetry. Uh, the anti-commuting nature of this variable, of this new coordinate, uh, brings in also a, some a very important result. The fact that this object is anti-commuting tells you that necessarily the two coefficients, the two fields, four-dimensional fields, 
must obey different statistics. So that means that necessarily the, this particle living in superspace casts two shadows in onto four-dimensional space-time, and these two uh, shadows must have different spin, different uh, spin statistics problem, properties. So this shows that the nature of, of superspace is quantum. So you can't even conceive supersymmetry without quantum mechanics because spin is a property that exists only in quantum mechanics. So that means that superspace somehow, even before you quantize a theory, has in itself embodied the properties of, uh, uh, of quantum mechanics. There's also another interesting consequence of this. If we're saying that the same object describes a boson and a fermion, but we know the boson and fermion have different spin, meaning that they transform differently under rotation in ordinary space. But if these two transform differently under uh, rotation in ordinary space, that means a supersymmetry, which is the, the, pro the algebraic properties that are related to, must also involve space-time coordinate and space-time transformations. But, as we know, that uh, when you, when you uh, consider the gauge theory of space-time transformation, that is gravity, that gives you gravity, automatically supersymmetry in its local version must contain gravity. That was also an, an, an incredible, powerful result, and uh, indeed uh, this was realized uh, uh, very quickly, and in 1974, uh, uh, um, uh, Friedman, uh, Van Novenhausen, and, uh, and Ferrara formulated what is now called supergravity. Uh, there also, a very important aspect of supersymmetry is that uh, when you do uh, quantum, so now when you quantize a theory and you look at the quantum level, you find very special properties of finiteness. That if you look at, if you treat the various fields as independent, it looks like some magic property. And these magic properties can only un under be understood when you go to the real entity, which is superspace, and you don't just use the projection. So it was uh, clear that supersymmetry really involves a revolution in concept. However, uh, during the 70s, the exercise of developing supersymmetry was uh, very much left to the creativity of some field theorists, and it seemed, it wasn't, it wasn't clear why people were doing it. They were more interested in the mathematical properties of the theory, and they were developing theory as a mathematical tool. But the final goal was completely uh, unclear. In a sense, supersymmetry, uh, but it was clear that supersymmetry had this magic property. So, it, it, you know, physicists had this tool, this special tool in their hands, but they didn't know what to use it for, in a sense. So it was a, it was a solution in search of a problem. Well, finally, the problem was found. And uh, this was in the beginning of the 80s. I've asked, uh, I've asked uh, m uh, many of my uh, older colleagues to tell me what to... What was the revelation? What was the, the person or the paper who really understood that supersymmetry has something to do with low energy? And generally, the answer that I get, for instance, from my advisor, I got the answer, well, we all knew it. It was obvious to everybody. In a sense, my, my, my feeling is that uh, it was some kind of an adiabatic transition where the uh, the community started to understand what naturalness meant and, and how supersymmetry could deal with that. It was rather quick. It was really in the very beginning of the 80s. But also I think that most people agree that the paper that really made people realize clearly the problem was a paper by Ed Witten in, uh, in 81. So the problem was well known, the problem of naturalness, which essentially is this. It's a problem that doesn't exist in supersymmetry, but it in, uh, sorry, in the standard model. It does not exist in the standard model, but it exists as soon as you have the belief that the standard model is not a complete theory, but the standard model is just part, it's just an effective theory, which is a remnant of a more fundamental theory that happens at some higher energy, lower 
uh, um, dimension scale or, 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 or smaller distances. Okay, and uh, and then and then the problem comes because once you have this second uh, the second mass scale, you find that. Uh, 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 the, the Higgs uh, boson mass receives uh, correction, quantum corrections, which are proportional to the large mass. And so, in a sense, it's, uh, it seems that it's impossible in a quantum field theory to separate the properties of a light uh, fundamental scalars from the scale, from the masses of the new particles that happen at high energy. Well, supersymmetry was, uh, uh, it was found that avoided this problem in the sense that it was canceling this ultraviolet sensitivity, ultraviolet at very short distances, and making this possible. Of course, to make it possible, and that was a prediction, supersymmetry had to be broken only at, 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 at low scale, meaning that new particles have to come up, have to exist, uh, in the mass range of between 100 and 300 GB. Well, this realization really made uh, the whole picture of supersymmetry explode. From being a divertissement of a, of a small community of field theorists, it became the most popular tool in uh, theoretical particle physics. That was a real explosion, but an explosion that makes sense if you look at it historically, because it was really the logical next step. Remember that those were the years in which the standard model had been established. And the standard model, in a sense, is a triumph of one idea, of gauge symmetry. And it took, it took decades for physicists to understand that that was a solution, but clearly it, it emerged that gauge symmetry is the solution, is the way in which nature describes forces. And this is a highly non-trivial statement because we know that forces in nature, think of gravity, electromagnetism, weak, strong forces, are completely different in the way they manifest in the world. So just the idea that actually there's a single principle that can describe all of them is really a magnificent result. So inebriated from, the, from this uh, tremendous result, physicists thought, well, there should be another step. The next step should be enlarging now symmetries. And Clearly, supersymmetry seemed the perfect candidate to do this because it had a new concept of space-time, of symmetry, and was giving the, uh, the promise of new uh, unification. Not only that, of course, it was embraced as quickly also by experimentalists because uh, supersymmetry had the promise for a new golden era of experimental physics, uh, you know, the luxuries that physicists had in the 50s and the 60s, that whatever machine you turn on, you discover more particles than you ever believed that could exist. Well, this was to be the case. So the search started with all the machines that existed at that time, uh, the SPS, Petra, Tevatron. But I think that the most important step at that time was, uh, the, most, the biggest expectation was from LEP. So LEP started in 89, which actually happens also the time that I finished my PhD, so I entered physics, or maybe I see it that as a starting point because it was starting on my scientific career. But uh, I think it was clear it was the machine in which most the community was expecting the discovery. Supersymmetry was not discovered, but LAMP gave two very important messages that influenced physicists very much. The first message, uh, is that, uh, okay, supersymmetry was predicting a light Higgs boson. The, light, the Higgs boson was not found, but there were indications from the lab results that the electroweak breaking sector is weakly interacting. By weakly interacting, I mean that there should exist some state which are much lighter than the scale at which you violate uh, perturbative unitarity. Uh, that was very important because at that time, there were essentially two leading theories to explain naturalness. One was supersymmetry, one was, uh, was technicolor. And in a sense, that was uh, uh, the death of technicolor. And so out of lamp, while uh, technicolor was left uh, mortally wounded in the battlefield, supersymmetry uh, remained uh, triumphant. Triumphant because of the second point. And the second point was that precise measurement of alpha S and uh, of all the gauge coupling constant 
showed that if you take the measure value and you extrapolate at high energy, then supersymmetry gives a quantitative much better uh, uh, unification prediction than the standard model. Also in the standard model is remarkable the result, but there is this uh, numerical coincidence that in supersymmetry it seems that this three line almost perfectly meet at a point. So as a result of these two messages, uh, uh, so supersymmetry was not discovered by lab, but certainly for most theories, its case was strengthened. And at that point, uh, the popularity of supersymmetry was just keep on going up in the stock market of theoretical ideas. Um, as you know from the stock market, things change quickly. And indeed, soon after, uh, there were problems. Uh, there were two problems for me. Uh, one problem uh, is uh, uh, um, connected to the uh, uh, energy upgrading of LAP, the LAP2, which set some bounds on the Higgs mass and on the supersymmetric particles, which were quite uncomfortable for theory. The second point was the discovery that the universe is accelerating. And from that, you believe you can measure the cosmological constant. You find that the cosmological constant has an energy scale of 10 to the minus 3 EV, which is a scale in which we don't see any, any uh, new physics threshold. And that makes you suspicious that the argument of naturalness seems to fail in the case of the cosmological constant. So are we really sure that it works in the case of the Higgs? Of course, the enthusiasm for the coming LHC is too strong, and, uh, and people were just uh, anxious to see what, uh, what nature is saying, not speculations, but not what nature directly is saying. And before I pass the ball to, uh, to Gigi, that was going to tell us what they actually found, let me just stress that the search for supersymmetry is a, is a very... Uh, very wide uh, and complicated uh, story. Because it's like, suppose that some theorist would tell you, oh, no, I have a great idea, many, many years ago. It said, now I know the principle of nature. It's gauge symmetry. And tell experimentalists, go and look for gauge symmetry. Well, you know, an experimentalist, what should they look for? You know, the jets of QCD, or the radiation of QED, or the phenomenon of, of uh, uh, heavy... Uh, vector uh, gauge bosons, as in the case of the weak. So clearly, also in the case of supersymmetry, supersymmetry is an idea, then the way it manifests can be very dif different. That's why the life of experimentalists is very difficult. Yet, I think we are in a stage which is better because theory can make some statements which are fairly robust. One statement is, as I showed you, supersymmetry sort of tells you that the fundamental entity is such that it casts a double image. But that double image tells you that there should be a second particle, but all the quantum numbers of this second particle must be related to the original one, except for spin. So meaning that, uh, 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 that uh, uh, the supersymmetry tells you that uh, the charges, the gauge charges, and it also tells you the value of the spin, which is different than the original one, of all the new particles. Also, then you can use gauge symmetry. And gauge symmetry tells you all the kind of interactions. So that we can predict. Now you may say, well, pretty much, that's it. Then the model is nailed. Well, there is one element that theory and just symmetries cannot tell you, which is the mass spectrum of these new particles. And this is because it comes from the supersymmetry breaking, and we don't know exactly the structure of the supersymmetry breaking. It may look as a detail, and for theorists, maybe it is just a small detail, but for experimentalists, it's a crucial point. Because as you change the spectrum, it's not that just, you know, you are modifying the masses of the particle, but you're modifying completely the decay chains and the experimental signals. So the way you look at supersymmetry is, is totally different, and I think you'll see uh, in, uh, in the presentation by, by, by Gigi. We have some... Uh, organizing principles, which are not necessarily a, a coming down from the fundamental laws, but they have some uh, theoretical justification. And the most important one is our parity. Our parity is a, is a symmetry that is a discrete symmetry that distinguishes between the normal particle that we have observed and the supersymmetric partner, this second image, the second, the second side of the, 
of the same coin, right? Which is the one that we want to, uh, to discover. One is even, the other one is odd. Now, that means that all these new particles are odd under this symmetry, which means that they have to be produced in pairs. And, and also, uh, the other important thing for the experiment is that uh, the lightest uh, of this new particle has to be stable, and this gives a celebrated signal of missing energy and also gives a connection with dark matter. But there are many other uh, possibilities, as you will see, and I think this is a good point now that I stir your interest in supersymmetry to see what really happened at the LHC. Grazie, John. Rolandi, who is going to report about the experimental uh, attack to this supersymmetry. He is one of the fathers of the biggest and most precise TPC ever constructed, the one of Aleph. I was in a competing experiment and I remember the envy with, what, with which I looked at their mass spectra. And uh, then uh, I did the good choice the, the, time, the next time because I went in CMS uh, and uh, Gigi was one of the persons who, who built uh, the very precise CMS tra tracker. He has been the spokesperson of uh, Aleph, he has been uh, the physics coordinator of CMS and is still one of the leading persons in the CMS, CMS management. He's a professor at La Scuola uh, normale di Pisa, and uh, I think that this is enough, and let's, <laughs> let's listen from him now. Grazie, grazie, grazie molto, Franco. Uh, so, good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, for many reasons, but also because I have so many good friends here in Padova, it's a good occasion to see them. So, yes, uh, I think that uh, John described extremely well uh, the, uh, the atmosphere that uh, there was in the experimental community before the startup of LHC. But uh, let me remind to you also one thing. He said uh, uh, that his advisor was uh, telling that this is uh, the idea that uh, supersymmetry could be, could be in the real world uh, very soon was known to everybody. I very well remember a speech that, that Riccardo Barbieri gave to the, uh, to the LEP, uh, to actually to the Aleph experiment, and probably was 86, 87, huh? so close to the, the, the time of the paper of Witten. Uh, that, and where he was coming, telling that it's for sure that we had, we had to find supersymmetry. And actually, this was a very good question, because the LEP detector were not designed to discover supersymmetry. They were designed for general purpose, but uh, we, we made supersymmetry searches at LEP, and uh, they were actually were not, were not satisfactory. But the LHC detector really were designed having in mind, having in mind supersymmetry. Uh, the, this I will try to show to you in a moment. Okay, everybody knows about the, the, the LEP tunnel where uh, now LHC is there, and LHC can, can reach very large energies thanks to these spectacular magnets. There are 12,000 of them in the tunnel, each worth uh, a good million of, uh, <laughs> of euros, with strength, whatever you want. Uh, and uh, uh, now they've been refurbished, and uh, now they are able to reach the, the 8 Tesla a field that allows the beam to be accelerated till uh, close to, 40, to, to, eight, uh, to 7 TV and then colliding uh, with the center of mass energy close to 14 TV. Uh, the huge experiments that uh, have been uh, constructed to measure in detail uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the collisions of, this, uh, of, this, uh, um, of, the, of the protons inside the LHC uh, are here, Atlas and CMS, they are very big in size, but they are capable to measure details of the collision with extreme, extreme precision. Um, and uh, the uh, one important uh, uh, aspect is that they have been built hermetic. Uh, they have been built hermetic because, as you will see in a moment, uh, the one of the important signatures is the fact that uh, 
there is something escaping from detection during, a, during an interaction. And being, uh, building them hermetic really is uh, uh, an enterprise because uh, you have uh, cables and services that have to go out everywhere. And so the design of this detector has been very careful and uh, they cover essentially the complete solid angle but from a small fraction, it's uh, uh, one degree. Huh? In the, forward, in the forward and backward direction. So limiting at the maximum the, the loss of en the, the energy that can escape from, a from, uh, uh, from uh, I wanted to show this to you, but for some reason it doesn't start. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's not, uh, it, was, it was a nice movie, but it's uh, it, not, nothing special. You see, the, the principle for detection is shown here. We, we produce many, many particles at each interaction. Actually, you will see in a moment a picture of one event where you can get an idea of how crowded it is. And then uh, both Atlas and CMS, you see here CMS, they are able not only to measure precisely all the particles, but also to identify the, the produced particle, thanks to the various detectors that gives different signatures to the, value, to the various particles produced. And you will see that this plays a key role in the search for supersymmetry. You can, you can reconstruct electrons from interaction with the, the, with the calorimeter. You can reconstruct muons from the fact that they go across, the, 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 they pass the full detector arriving outside. And many of my friends here, here in Padova have spent quite a number of years to commission, to, build, to invent and commission this detector that works very nicely. Now, the interactions are very complex. Uh, the, uh, this is a picture uh, of one event uh, taken by, by the um, Atlas detector where you see an enlargement of uh, the uh, near the interaction region. This uh, spans something like uh, 10 centimeters in the interaction region, while here this is something like 20 meters. Uh, and you see that uh, at the luminosity we are, run, we are running today, uh, LHC produced many, many, on average uh, 20 in uh, 2012 and uh, a bit more in the future years, uh, um, interactions per beam crossing. Usually these interactions are not interesting. Uh, they are low Q square interaction, but uh, their, their rate is very high. The collision, the, the, the collision rate is half a gigahertz. Uh, so it means since we, we go at uh, 20, 20 megahertz during this run, that uh, we have many interaction per beam crossing. Huh? And uh, the, uh, while the collision, the collision rate is 0.5 gigahertz, event like this one, where you have a Z produced from in one of the vertex that you can discover thanks to the two muons that you identify since they cross all the texture, these are very rare events. This uh, happens only at the rate of 0.1 hertz. So there is a, a very complex system capable to pin, to pin down from this, uh, this uh, half a gigahertz, the one kilohertz of events that we are able to put on tape. And the luminosity that was delivered to LHC in 2012 was uh, roughly 20, by LHC to CMS and data, roughly 20, 20 inverse phantoband that corresponds to 10 to the 15 proton-proton collisions uh, on, at ATV and only 10 to the minus 5 of them are recorded on disk. So this means that we have very complex systems that uh, do the first analysis online in order to select out of this huge rate the few, few events that uh, we want, uh, that we will analyze. So we start from 10 to the 15 events, and uh, if you look at the cross sections that you have for supersymmetry uh, that are reported here, you see that the level of cross section of 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.1 uh, picobarn corresponds to roughly uh, 1,000 events will allow you to explore uh, supersymmetry up to, to energies, to masses of the order of 1 TV. Jan said before that in supersymmetry we know everything but from the masses of the particles. Huh? And this allows to 
to, to make a clear prediction as a function of the masses of the particle. Here is reported the average mass, so you have not to take this uh, as uh, exact, uh, exact uh, numbers, but this gives you a clear idea that if you are able to pick up uh, 1,000 events with a special signature out of the 10 to the 15 that have been produced by LHC, you will be able to see if supersymmetry is there. But this is really something extraordinary, because uh, together with, <laughs> with the possible supersymmetry, you have a lot of other interaction that uh, have a special signature. Just one uh, uh, that, that is a competing uh, um, signature for supersymmetry, when you have a production of a W together with jets, uh, you have a cross-section of 400 picobarn to be compared to the point of, uh, say five, 10 to the minus two picobarn that you want uh, to explore here. So four orders of magnitude of uh, an important background uh, with respect to the signal that you are searching. So you need really good strategies and very performing detector. So there are uh, different experimental strategy for different signal hypotheses. The most uh, uh, popular one is the one that Jan introduced is a search for RP conserving supersymmetry. RP conserving supersymmetry means that there are two particles in each event that are the, the, the lightest supersymmetric particle that escape undetected, like neutrinos, heavy neutrinos. And since they escape undetected, your event will have missing energy. An event that I will show, I can show now the picture, will be look like that. An event where you produce many jets, many particles, and when you add up all the transverse momenta of, your, of the particles you have measured, you get a significant, a significant missing transverse energy. This is something very rare in the standard model. It happens in some cases with that uh, create background to the searches. Uh, and, uh, but clearly, this is a signal that can be faked by um, effects uh, that are purely instrumental. I mean, if you, are not, uh, if you have a hole in the detector, if your efficiency to measure this jet, one, one jet, is not good, uh, imagine that you had the jet exactly here that you have not measured, then you will, cre you will create uh, instrumental fake missing energy. So it, it really requires, uh, requires a good understanding of the detector, but especially an hermetic detector. You are sure that uh, any, any particle produced cannot escape. And if the particle goes exactly there in the, in the, in the small uh, region near the pipe, since you have taken an angle that is 0.01, uh, a particle of 1 TV essentially will not, will not harm you too much. Uh, will, will produce a, a transverse momentum of 10 GV, and this doesn't, doesn't matter too much. Now, the missing energy is... Uh, an important uh, aspect of those events. Uh, this missing energy is produced by those two missing uh, neutralinos. Uh, and, but uh, these events uh, can have a very different topology. Depending on the mass spectrum, depending on the relation between the masses of the supersymmetric super particles, the branching ratio of the produced particle in one, in one channel or in another will be different. So we, one can have many different final states. Here is uh, the gluino, that is uh, the, the other shade of the gluon, uh, that uh, can uh, decay in this particular model. You see here numbers for the branching ratio in different final states. But since you don't know the ratio of the masses, this, uh, you, can, you can create supersymmetry with very different branching ratio. What comes out always is that for air parity, for air parity conserving supersymmetry, you will have missing ET, and you can have jets. You can have jets with big quarks that are particularly rare. Uh, or you can have, uh, quite often, leptons plus jets, uh, and you can have also here big jets. So two different strategies are uh, foreseen, uh, depending on all, all of them with missing energy but depending on the, how many leptons you will look inside the event. Huh? You will find inside the event. And uh, so what is needed for that is a detector that can measure well the missing ET and that can identify well 
jets, bijets, and leptons. So, what is your signal? Uh, master reconstruction is not possible, possible because you have uh, the neutralino that escapes in this event. No? So you will reconstruct, in this, uh, in this event you will reconstruct uh, the two bijets, but you will not see the neutralino. And since you don't see the neutralino, you cannot do the, the obvious search, that is to search for a mass peak. No? When, when we, we have discovered the Higgs, we have seen into two gamma, and in four leptons, we have seen a clear mass peak. Here you cannot. So the, the, the strategy is uh, the following. You look for uh, a signature where, uh, in a region that where your signal is, uh, your expected signal is enhanced, and you need to compare the rate that you will measure in that region that will never be completely background free. You, you have to compare the rate that you measure with the prediction of the standard model. Here you see uh, reported the missing energy. The si è scaricato. C'è un, un altro? No, you see here uh, the missing energy divided by something that resembles its resolution uh, and the number of events uh, and you see that in the tail of this uh, distribution you expect uh, a signal for uh, a particular incarnation of a supersymmetry that is uh, a situation where you have a gluino of 900 GV and uh, a neutralino of 150 GV. This would be the rate if it were there, these points would be here. So in order to do, to, to, uh, to do this, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, research, you need many things. You need a very precise calculation of the standard model cross-section. Uh, you need to predict what, is, uh, what you expect from normal phenomena in every region of the phase space. You need uh, to have a very good control of detector efficiency and resolution because the number of events that you will measure at a given point will not depend only on how many have been produced, but how many have put on tape and how many you have reconstructed. So the whole chain, starting from the trigger to the final plot, must be understood and validated. And this is done using control regions where no signal is expected. The strategy is the following. Evaluate the standard model prediction in this systematic error, compare the measure distribution with the prediction. If you find an excess, you have found the discovery. What it will be? is another question. Huh? This will be sent back <laughs> to, our, to our colleagues for, uh, for validation, for validation of the discovery. But it will be a discovery. I mean, you have understood that uh, what is the background, and if this point would be here significantly, this would be a discovery. If uh, no excess is found, and you will see that this has been the case, otherwise you would have known from many sources at this point, uh, if no, so no, no excess is found, you compute the maximum cross-section compatible with the observation. Uh, so the, the maximum cross-section that you can accommodate in this tail compatible uh, with this observation and to interpret this cross-section within a fusi, FUSI model, typically as a function of the masses of the particles involved, because here the masses are the only things that we do not know. The... Um, I told you before that you can do searches depending on how many leptons you have seen in the final state, and typically the, you have decreasing background, increasing the number of leptons, but the searches more inclusive have, a, have a higher signal acceptance. So these are the, the searches that would be sensitive with smaller luminosity or that can, ex, can, can extend the mass regime. So the, the main strategy I told you is to find, uh, to, uh, to measure the missing transverse uh, energy. Actually, this is missing transverse momentum. We call it traditionally missing transverse energy, and this is, is causes confusion. Uh, and uh, as I told you before, uh, what is the, the difficulty is really to have a control of what the detector measure with very good precision, because any imbalance in this very high energetic object, I mean, if this 231 is measured because there is a dead channel or for other reasons as 131, you would uh, create 100 GV missing transverse energy. Now I show you a spectrum that uh, you see if uh, you don't, uh, when you switch on the detector and you don't do anything. Huh? Imagine that you switch on the detector and you measure the missing transverse energy. 
if you do it with uh, 1,000 events, you find a beautiful agreement. Huh? But then, when you look at uh, things that happen uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, I told you we have to go to 10 to the minus 12. Huh? When, when you go to that level, uh, you, go, you start to see things that are abnormal. And these are uh, effects that, that you get in your detector just by chance. I mean, these are events with, taken with the jet trigger where you should not see any missing energy. And you, switching on the detector, you see this long tail. And then you start uh, a sort of investigation, uh, and it is like a catch al tesoro. I mean, you, leak, you start to understand where it can come from. And you must be sure that you put recipes that do not kill your signal, uh, because uh, <laughs> it's what you want to, to look for. So in, you start to, to see noise in the calorimeter. Uh, the calorimeter are noisy, they invent photons and they invent a neutral hadron. But uh, if you look at the pattern of the energy distribution, this is unphysical. You see uh, that uh, an entire group of channels that, uh, that, that, would, that are correlated because they are in the same power supply go up. So you can kill them. Then you have bimalos. You have muons that transverse the detector and leave energy. And this you can identify by timing. Then, uh, in some cases, the laser calibration system misfires. And instead of being out of time, it happens to be in one event. Huh? And then also you can reconstruct from the pattern. And then, uh, in very rare cases, you have a coherent noise on the preamplifier of the tracker. And then you invent such a huge number of bits that you make uh, a large number of fake tracks, and so on. So, after a lot of uh, investigations and, uh, and studies, you see that eventually you can kill all these effects, and the, 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 uh, the missing energy tail in those events happens to be what it, uh, you expect it to be. And then you validate, you validate your, uh, uh, your job, using special events that are the muon events, so where you produce a Z plus jet, these events should have no missing energy. Huh? And so you can validate this, uh, and you can compare in these special events, you can compare the missing, the missing uh, energy, and you see that it uh, is exactly as predicted, the bulk comes from um, Z mu mu, uh, that, has, uh, that extends up to some 100 GV because of tail signal distribution, your capability to measure, and then you have a long tail doing to the fact that you get two muons also in TT bar events, and with small tails by other, by other contributors. And in the same event, you can measure not only the missing energy, but also what was the total energy in the detector, huh? to give you the scale of how is the imbalance respect to what you measure. Huh? And this is the validation in the same events, and you see that the the, the total uh, Z plus jet energy reach uh, energies up to 1600 GV, and this you, me you measure for the same events, the yellow one, you measure to 100 GV the missing energy. So you measure it to 10% in, in a good way. An important ingredient for those searches is the B-tagging. B-tagging is your capability to find that inside the one jet uh, there were few tracks uh, that uh, do not come from the primary vertex, signaling a particle with long lifetime. They are mainly B hadrons, uh, and so well, if you find them, uh, now the, I don't know if uh, you can see it well, yes, you see them well. Uh, if you go take the events, you enlarge near the vertex, and then if you, the resolution of the detector allows you to tell that this red track misses the primary vertex, and uh, with good alignment, uh, you can uh, you can estimate how probable that this happens by chance or that this is really something true. And, uh, and so, now, now that you have all the weapons, you can look for events with jet plus missing energy and no leptons. This is one event from Atlas. You see here a huge jet uh, of 974 GV plus few more uh, with less, jets with less energy, and you have an in these events, a missing energy of 984. You measure all the energy precisely with the calorimeters. And then you look at the, at the distributions. You, you divide the events as a function of the number of jets 
uh, and of the number of bijets uh, because the background indicated in these uh, plots uh, is different in the various categories. In the, in the, um, in the events uh, with small jet multiplicity, you are uh, uh, dominated by Z plus jet events, uh, where you have a Z that decays in two neutrinos, making uh, uh, physics missing energy. Uh, and uh, in the events uh, with many bijets, you are dominated by top events, uh, where the W decays uh, in, uh, um, in uh, lepton neutrino, and you miss the lepton. You miss the lepton because it is goes uh, some out of the acceptance uh, in your detector. So you, you measure carefully all uh, these, uh, uh, these various categories, and uh, this is the experimental distribution. The experimental distribution is, uh, are the black points hmm, here, and these are the various categories depending on how many jets and how many bijets you have found. Then uh, in, uh, you see in uh, green here is uh, the Z plus new new events. This is a, a, a reducible physics background. You plus a Z, that is an heavy object, that decays into neutrino, the neutrino escape undetected, and this is clear missing energy. And you see that uh, the, the, the second important background is uh, when you have a lepton coming together with a neutrino that you have not, uh, you don't reconstruct the lepton. And the third, the third background is QCD events, where you mismeasure. So you see the quality of this plot tells that the, the detectors have been designed extremely well. Huh? The, 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 the hermeticity is, is very good, and the, the, the background from, from mismeasuring from QCD events is very small compared to the physics background. And you see here, hashed, the uh, uncertainty in the prediction of the rate in each bin. And the fact that this edge is uh, pretty small means that you have uh, understood the calculation and you have understood the response of your detector pretty well. The sad thing is that uh, you see that the distribution of the measured points match very well uh, very well uh, with the, the measure, the, the, uh, the prediction. So essentially there is no evidence of an excess and we can compute the maximum signal cross-section that you can accommodate in each bin. And uh, the acceptance, time efficiency of each bin depends on the signal model, means on the masses of the particle. So what you do now to try to convey the information, this is the information of the detector, I mean, from the experiment. You try to translate this information in uh, limits on cross-section and masses. Uh, you do a very big simplification. You assume that supersymmetry can be simplified as only one decay chain. Uh, so I interpret the previous plot uh, in the assumption that the only thing that happens of supersymmetry at LHC is that you produce the two gluinos and each gluinos decays in a pair of BB bar plus a neutralino. In, in this assumption, assuming that this branching ratio is 100% and there are no other supersymmetry incarnation happening at LHC, I can compute for a given mass of the gluino and a given mass of the neutralino, I can compute what is the acceptance time is time is efficiency of my detector. Once I know acceptance time efficiency, I can see what is the largest cross-section that is compatible with the data. And this is what you see here in the color plot. It means that, that for a gluino of 1,000 GV and a neutralino of uh, 200 GV, the cross-section is 10 to the minus 3 picobar. This is the largest cross-section that I can accommodate in the data. So, why this plot looks like this? You see that uh, near the diagonal, uh, we have uh, very, uh, we can accommodate larger cross-section in the data, so it means we have uh, poor limits. Uh, and this because uh, near the diagonal, the gluino and the neutralino have almost the same mass. Have almost the same mass means that what I will see in my detector is uh, the effect of the difference between the, the gluino and the neutralino, so very little energy. Uh, and if I have very little energy, everything is difficult. I cannot uh, trigger uh, on small energy. And then I, also the background would be very large because at, uh, with small visible energy, the standard model background is much larger. When the visible energy becomes larger and larger, then 
I, I will be able to accommodate a smaller cross-section inside the data, and I will be more sensitive. So, given the cross-section that uh, for each point here, I can take the cross-section, compare for a, given, for a given mass what is the expectation for, for SUSI, and I say, okay, since here at 800 GV, I expect a cross-section of 0.1, here I will be able to exclude cross-section up to 0.1. And you can draw this contour that tells you what is the excluded region in the plane gluino neutralino. This edge is due to the, to the limit case where the neutralino and the gluino have the same, have the same mass. And so the result of this uh, experiment, of this specific interpretation, that is a very specific model, uh, tells you that the, the LHC has not produced the gluinos up to, an, uh, um, to, a, to a mass of uh, 1300, 1400 TV, and, uh, this, uh, and but the neutralino mass had to be smaller than 800, uh, 800 GV. To give you an idea, this limit point corresponds to 20 produced events. So the analysis has been sensitive to pick up 20 produced events out of 10 to the 15 generated events from proton proton interaction. Fantastic. Very quickly, I show you what happens in the case where you have one lepton plus missing energy. These are nice events where you see uh, here an electron coming out from, from the atlas detector. And here, what is important is that you understand very well what are the efficiency and uh, uh, with which you can, you can identify the leptons, because they will normalize your cross-section and your prediction. And in order to understand this efficiency, what we exploit are the fact that, well, that uh, when you produce a resonance decaying in two muons on two electrons, you produce two muons or two electrons. So you can predict the existence of the other one. And using a technique that is called the tag and probe, you can measure very efficiently the, the efficiency for electrons and for muons as a function of their PT. And so normalize your effect. Here is a plot measured by Atlas where you plot the transverse mass, that is the momentum of the lepton, times the missing energy that you measure in that event, times uh, 1 minus cosinus of the angle, square root. This is a, f a very known formula. In these events, since you have one lepton and missing energy, you can compute it. Huh? And uh, here you see in the tail that, again, for an incarnation of supersymmetry, here with a stop of 500 GV and a neutralino of 200 GV, you would have a signal like this one, just uh, above the data. And, uh, but uh, for this other incarnation, you would have a larger, a larger, uh, a larger effect. Now, this uh, allows you to study the, this following uh, channel, that is a uh, uh, stop that decays to bottom lepton neutrino. So here you have the lepton. And on the other side, to bottom quark, 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 quark. So you have the two neutralinos in the final state giving the missing energy and the lepton. Depending on the masses, on the mass difference between neutralino, uh, stop and neutralino, you can have various channels. This one for large masses where the stop decays to top neutralino. This for intermediate masses when the stop decays to bottom W neutralino, and this uh, for low, low masses where you have uh, a, a, the, the stop decaying to sharp. So this different final state can all, all be studied with the same analysis with the lepton plus jet. And uh, the various region that you see here depends on different kinematics. For example, here the um, uh, neutralino is produced at rest because on this kinematic limit you produce uh, the, uh, the, the top decays to uh, you, you produce a top at rest with, together with the neutralino. And here is the big work that is produced at rest. So studying these events in the, in the virus final state, you can put uh, um, limits, uh, as you see in this region, and you will have uh, some region near the kinematic edge where you don't measure anymore. 
I mean, these limits are put exactly with the same logic of the previous one. I could continue for three or four hours telling you all the different uh, regions of the phase space that have been explored. They are boring huh? because <laughs> you, don't see, you don't see results from many of them. But let me show you some uh, nice uh, uh, example of different searches because there are regions in, in, the, super, in the supersymmetry mass combination when it happens that the particles may have a long lifetime. May they have, if the mass difference has uh, the, the appropriate uh, uh, combination, uh, particles can live a lot, and uh, then they, they will give strange signature in all detector. Uh, and the most spectacular one is where you have an heavy particle that has a long lifetime, and, uh, and this, uh, uh, since it's heavy, will, uh, will, uh, will uh, run with, uh, uh, with speed that is smaller than the speed of light. So it implies that to reach the end of CMS, an heavy particle that goes with beta 0.5 arrives one bunch crossing later. So in, if you don't do anything, the information would be stored in the next event. So the, the action has been taken in order to store the muon information in many, many, for many events uh, copying it from, from the subsequent and the previous. And uh, doing that, uh, you are able to be efficient in the search for, long, uh, for, uh, for particles with long lifetime. And uh, the, other, uh, the other obvious uh, variable is to look for a specific ionization. A particle with beta 0.5 will have a very specific pattern for the ionization. And this is the ionization that you would see in the silicon detector. We have been searching for it. No sign. Another uh, very fancy and interesting thing is that uh, you can produce uh, error hadron where essentially you have a gluino that, where the, uh, that enters in an hadron, huh? like a gluon. And the, the color field of the gluino is taken, but now this gluino is very massive. Huh? So when, when uh, this air hadron travels inside the detector, this uh, very light part, Normal, uh, normal hadronic part interacts with matters, uh, with nuclei, and the, the, the air hadron can change, can change its charge. So it could, uh, could fly in, uh, inside, the, inside your detector, becoming, being, starting as a track, a charged positive, uh, as a charged particle, and then can become, can become neutral. Or start as a neutral and then become become uh, uh, charged. So this is a very difficult signature because uh, you, uh, you don't expect it for a normal particle. When you reconstruct a muon, you reconstruct the charged particle here and also there. So you have to adapt your software in order to look for these very strange, very strange cases. And uh, a, a, an inclusive way to look at it is uh, to select those events where uh, the particle stops inside your detector. And then it stays there for a while, and then it decays. So you have to search for particles that gives, to you, gives a signal to you not in coincidence with the bunch crossing. This can be done not only after LHC has, has stopped these beams, has dumped the beams, but can be done also while LHC is running because the, um, the repetition of the bunch crossing is not homogeneous. So we say always that we have a bunch crossing every 50 nanoseconds. This is not true. There are gaps inside this sequence. For example, here there, is, there are 919 missing bunches. Here there are 39 missing bunches. And so you can explore with this method the case at the moment you do not have have uh, uh, collisions, and then you are sensitive to a long range of lifetime, to, from very short one to very long one, because the, the, the run can be very long. But in order to do that, uh, you have to look at which signature you would see. The signature would be like that, like having energy in the calorimeter out of, of collision. But you can have also uh, this by, uh, by, by, by different backgrounds. For example, you have bimalo. Huh? This bimalo exists also when the, they don't get the bunches, huh? and uh, to, some, to some extent. And the bimalo can produce a signal similar to, uh, in, uh, in the calorimeter, signal to your events. Or you can have a cosmic ray faking, faking this. So also here you have to take, to take uh, accurate things and 
And then uh, when, uh, when, you, when you, uh, you do your analysis, uh, you essentially can uh, exclude uh, uh, gluinos that uh, have lifetime between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the 8 seconds with, uh, uh, depending on the mass, up to masses of the order of 800 GV. Another, another category of uh, nice events uh, is when uh, the lifetime is uh, uh, not so short that it, the, the, the particle decays at the vertex, but not long enough that it arrives uh, the detector where it, it can be stopped. Huh? So are, uh, these are, uh, are uh, particles that decay, that decay after a few centimeters uh, from, from the vertex. And uh, this uh, can, can be studied. You, for this, you have to write a special software capable to produce tracks that decay far from the primary vertex. This software is, is validated using uh, k zeros that have this property, but being far from, uh, from the vertex. And you see that uh, the software is uh, uh, reproduce data and simulation match very well. And so you can select uh, events like this. Uh, you can be sensitive to events where you produce uh, a chargino that decays into a neutralino and a very slow pion, uh, evaporation pion, uh, that is not measured. So a track that stops inside your detector and you don't have its anymore. Uh, so you do this search mm, and the search is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the signature for this analysis is uh, uh, isolated IPT track several missing hits in the outer detector, and no energy associated with, uh, with inside the calorimetry. You look for that, you search, and you see a signal. It's beautiful. Unfortunately, the signal had the property that the missing hits happen to be exactly in the middle of uh, our detector. Since the detector is done by two sensors, you have a small inefficient region in the, exactly in the middle. And so when uh, looking in detail where this was generated, we discovered that we had to improve our reconstruction program in order to take account also for this inefficiency. So all in all, this is uh, the end of the story. The, this uh, summary table tells you that we have been searching for supersymmetry under each, cor each stone and in each corner of uh, uh, the phase space opened by, the, by LHC and we have not found anyone. And now I leave it back to Jan. How much time do I have? <laughs> okay, try, I'll try not to abuse your patience. Uh, so let me now tell you, you, you saw this uh, uh, wonderful result of this uh, fantastic uh, detectors that could get these limits. Now, let's see the other side of the story. How did uh, theorists uh, react to, this, uh, to these limits and this work? And uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a catastrophe. I mean, people that worked all their life on supersymmetry, what's going on? How is it possible that you haven't seen supersymmetry? What am I going to do for the rest of my life? And so on. Um, now, uh, let's see, are theories too emotional? I've taken uh, too much uh, uh, pessimism out of that. And one really has to take the perspective that uh, these results, this magnificent result shown by Gigi, uh, used, uh, were based on 20 inverse uh, femtobarn of data taken at ATV. The story of the LHC is a lot bigger. I mean, right now, as you know, we are on the eve of a second phase of the LHC in which we are going to gain more than 60% of energy. There will be a run of, 30, of, thir uh, of 13 uh, TV center of mass, which maybe also in the future is going to increase uh, a little bit. And uh, the, pr the, the prospect is to collect the full program of the LHC, 300 inverse femtobar, and if an upgrading in luminosity will take place, we are talking about 3,000 inverse femtobar. So clearly this is just the beginning of the search and uh, there is a lot more that will happen. Uh, this was a plot shown by Gigi on the limit on the stop uh, uh, as a function of the neutralino mass. And you remember 
he reached about 700 GV in the best case. And this shows the, uh, the reach that will be possible, the, the discovery of exclusion that will be possible, uh, with 300 and 3,000 inverse femtobar. And you see that we are talking about uh, 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 possible reaching the exclusion about 1.2 to 1.4 uh, TV in the mass. So it's really, we're talking about a factor of two increase uh, in the mass reach. It's fairly significant. Same thing if I show you a plot of Squark versus Gluino. Right now, the, plot, the, the limits that were shown by Gigi sort of are really at the very corner of parameter space, and with 300 or 3,000 inverse femtobar, we are talking about having a a sensitivity to gluino mass, let's take the worst case, of between 2.3 uh, to uh, 2.7 uh, TV. So clearly, there is still a lot more to explore. Uh, physics is a natural science. We should let data talk before we draw conclusions. But theorists are not that patient, and they draw conclusions nevertheless. So let me try to, to ask this question. Uh, when should we give up the idea of low energy supersymmetry? Was this, this is clearly was a cold shower, this first run, but uh, is it enough to say that's it? Or you know, do we, when do we put the end uh, to, this, uh, to this story? Well, let me give you some quotes which actually echo the word of... Uh, uh, that Gigi put in the, in the mouth of, of Ricardo at that time. I'm quoting uh, from a popular review on supersymmetry that came out uh, during the years of, uh, uh, of big popularity. Really, my, my eyes are getting really bad. I can't read uh, from here. So, uh, experiments, I should change my glasses, I suppose. Experiments within the next five to 10 years. This was written in 83. Uh, will enable us to decide whether supersymmetry as a solution of the naturalness problem uh, of the weak interaction scale is a myth of reality. Five to ten years. Uh, let me take another popular review, Haber and Kane, 84. Concludes, fortunately, if nature is not supersymmetric on the weak scale, it will be possible to know this definitively with the accelerators and detectors that should be available within about the next decade, written in 84. And there are many. I mean, I could really go on for that time. This was uh, uh, the general view. I can even quote uh, John Ellis, who was always more optimistic. 84, in these lectures, I hope to convince you that supersymmetry will soon, it doesn't give five or ten, it soon provide you with a whole new spectroscopy to investigate. Indeed, it may even be that experiments are already starting to reveal this spectroscopy to us. Um, were these people so wrong? I don't think so. I mean, it, this was the right expectation. At that time, they were thinking about LAMP, and LAMP was a machine to test the idea. Um, so, now, can we say that low energy supersymmetry is dead? Well, let me just look at two main predictions of supersymmetry, which are the two, I think, pillars of low energy supersymmetry because uh, they are the way in which theory connects to experiment. And these were the celebrated results uh, in the beginning of supersymmetry, which were so successful. One is a prediction of the Higgs mass. And here I'm showing you and uh, this band, this colored band, as a function of the supersymmetric uh, mass scale, for simplicity, I put all masses equal, uh, and uh, uh, I give you the prediction for the Higgs mass. Now we know the Higgs mass is about 125, so that means that I have to be within this range. Actually, uh, why there is this range? Well, there are details in the model. But I can tell you that in order to be here, you really have to twist the model significantly with parameters. So typically, it would populate more this region. At any rate, whatever you do, uh, the expectation of supersymmetry, of supersymmetric masses, is something between 2 TV and 10 TV. So way 
above what we were talking from naturalness. Indeed, the second prediction is a prediction for the Z mass. And this is a celebrated prediction that the Z mass has to be proportional to supersymmetric particle masses. This is the reason why people are saying, well, that's it. This is, uh, this is the connection between theory and experiments. Once all we need is that experiment will tell us what the supersymmetric masses are, then I plug in this formula and I can tell you what is the mechanism of supersymmetry breaking. Well, if you do this with the limits that exist today on STOP and Gluino, the story is very different because the supersymmetric contribution to the Z mass is roughly, in now little numbers, but is roughly 100 times bigger than the observed value. And remember, supersymmetry was there to solve the problem of tuning. Now, are you disturbed by the fact that we're already, it's already 100 times bigger than what should be? Of course, you know, by tuning different terms, you can make it as small as you want. Uh, but clearly, the, 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 the answer is the following, that if you believe in strict naturalness, then supersymmetry have been already excluded. So those quotations that I was giving before are not wrong. Uh, if you say, okay, you know, strict naturalness, oh, maybe it wasn't the wrong argument, and I should use other links like the Higgs mass or, or dark matter and so on, typically, as you've seen from the plot of the Higgs mass, the supersymmetric masses that come out, same thing with, with dark matter, are typically beyond the reach of, of the LHC. So clearly the picture is, is, is grim. This does not mean that we, should not, that we are not all uh, um, you know, with, with impatience uh, waiting for the new results, but some kind of skepticism, I think, is justified. So what's the conclusion? 40 years later is the original papers that I was showing. Should we say that uh, supersymmetry was just some social construct of theorists and uh, we should call it superstition rather than supersymmetry? Um, well, let me try to, to show you my point of view on this. Uh, I tried to convince in my introduction that the search of supersymmetry was not just looking for some new particles and seeing a certain models. It was really behind it a tremendously ambitious uh, and scientifically motivated idea behind this, uh, this whole enterprise of supersymmetry. We're talking about a new concept uh, of the even structure of, of space-time. And as always happens when you set yourself a very ambitious goal on the way, and I'm talking about theory, on the way we learn a lot. All these years in which we've been thinking about supersymmetry, we made some superb discoveries in quantum field theory that would have never happened otherwise. We learned something completely new about the possible structure of space-time, of symmetries, about non-perturbative dynamics. And it's often the case once an idea is open, you don't know where it leads. It could be that some of these methods that are being developed for supersymmetry will be used for completely different problems. And all the knowledge that was learned will be a tremendous success in, in other contexts. Uh, in my view, uh, this, uh, this, and of course, you know, the experimental program had a motivation which goes well beyond uh, supersymmetry. The, in my view, this whole story of supersymmetry incarnates the essence of pure scientific research. When you do pure scientific research, you set yourself very ambitious goals. If, they, uh, if you know where you're going, if you know that you're going to reach certain results, probably your goals were not ambitious enough. And that is the case of, of, of supersymmetries in which you have grand ideas, in which you have a, a, a wonderful experimental program going on, and you try to marry the two things, and you try to see how far you can go with the ball. So I really conclude from my point of view that anyone who thinks that the search for supersymmetry was a mistake if no discoveries are made has really understood nothing about what fundamental research is. Uh, last word, and then I conclude, I, 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 quote, I want to quote uh, Freeman Dyson, great physicist, but as you all know, also a great opponent of, uh, of the colliders before the SSC and now 
and, uh, and afterwards was uh, in the case of the LHC. But I think his words, so it's not a coincidence according to him, but these words fit very well what uh, the message that I want to convey. There is no illusion, he says, more dangerous than the belief that the progress of science is predictable. If you can predict the outcome of your program, you probably were not ambitious enough. And that's the essence of the research that's done in fundamental science. The idea of exploring, of breaking new grounds, of not knowing where you want to go. Of course, you have to do it with scientifically sound methods and in a scientifically motivated way. But you don't have to say that, that the, the program itself is only justified by the final result. The evolution of science and technology is a Darwinian process of the survival of the fittest. In science and technology, as in biological evolution, waste is the secret of efficiency. He used very harsh words, but very true. Without waste, you cannot find out which horse is the fittest. This is because he was giving an example of horses, how you decide. Of course, it's, it's British, so you think of all this horse, uh, horse running, right? He concludes, this is a hard lesson for politicians and administrators to learn. And I think as scientists, we should not forget what is the role of fundamental science when we assess the success of a, or a failure of a certain scientific program. Thank you. Very beautiful talk. Uh, there is uh, some uh, questions from the audience, either from the experimentalist side or from the theoretician side. So I may sta start just breaking the <laughs> So I know that you worked on uh, the uh, mass of the Higgs as a kind of a hint for a kind of a metastability of the universe. Is any relation of this with supersymmetry or against supersymmetry? It is completely or? orthogonal, okay? Because uh, uh, that the idea that uh, uh, that the universe is uh, is uh, metastable, uh, that we live in a metastable vacuum, is based on extrapolation of the standard model all the way to high energy. If you modify that assumption, you modify completely the conclusion. And supersymmetry actually is a perfect example of a modification of the theory in which the vacuum comes out stable. So uh, supersymmetry will cure that if that is a problem. But we first have to discover supersymmetry to make sure of that. And of course, the other thing I can say is that supersymmetry could cure the problem even if it's broken at much uh, higher energy. Uh, as I was saying, the, the, the measurement of the Higgs mass sort of hinting that maybe supersymmetry, if you believe in supersymmetry as a fundamental structure, and you forget for a moment the naturalness, you see that you can see some hints that maybe the supersymmetry breaking scale is way higher than what LHC can, can study. Uh, there are inter interesting consequences of, of, of this, and one possibility is, the, uh, is a nearly stable gluino that Gigi was mentioning, so there is a link there. So now from the audience. <laughs> been a long day, so I suppose. Can you comment about this new limit, uh, about the ADM of electron and proton that they almost succeed to go to 10 to the minus 30 right, right. electron centimeter in connection with the super sure, there? Sure. So okay, one, one chapter that you know, I was thinking and then I, I removed it at one of the reasons in which uh, uh, supersymmetry has in difficulty, uh, but you're alluding to is all kind of precision measurement coming from flavor physics or from CP violation and so on. Supersymmetry um, is a chame chameleon, so it can do anything you want pretty much. But if you take the simplest version, you would expect to have deviation in flavor physics that were not observed and to have at certain level effects on, uh, on present DDM of the electron of the neutron. 
So we are already in a ground, given these limits, uh, that put supersymmetry in difficulty. However, uh, the CP violation depends not only on the spectrum of supersymmetry, but on new phases that exist uh, in the supersymmetry breaking sector. And you can imagine uh, stories in which those phases are small because of some dynamical reason, not just because you tune into zero. But definitely, those limits are straining many of the existing models. Other questions? As you made many quotations, let me recall two historical facts. That uh, posty delay in the States uh, and in the kick in Europe uh, were dreaming to have uh, a, a machine that was an order of magnitude much energy. And the specific reason was to explore or the possible, reasonably possible phase space for uh, supersymmetry for both of them and many others. So it was not possible because the Americans started it, by the way, and they failed because of bad management, because it was too expensive, because the, the uh, iron curtain uh, fell down for many reasons. In Europe, we did not have the resources to do that. But several people still uh, already 20, 30 years ago thought that maybe that this energy is not enough. But let's hope it, that it is. I can give you my comment and probably maybe you know, JJ wants to comment. In a sense, uh, uh, I agree that was a, this is a little bit the revenge of the SSC. You know, at the time of the, uh, of the SSC, uh, I remember you know, much of the debate between Europe and, uh, and, and United States. United States, well, we need the full TV of the SSC because this is what we need to test the thing. And many people in Europe, I can quote, you know, Carlo Rubia, but he's not the only one, we're saying, well, we can do it with luminosity. Essentially, you know, we can do the LHC and we can get the same results because of luminosity. Uh, it was true for the mentality of the 80s when, for instance, supersymmetry was expecting 100 GV. But then things change, and now we're talking about a multi-TV. And so certainly uh, the SSC now would have been very different, uh, and the result they could have given very different than the LHC. But of course, no problem. We have a 100 TV machine in the, in the, in the horizon, so we'll go there. I yeah, I mean, you said, you said uh, with your last word, uh, clearly the limit uh, is given by our abilities of making magnets, uh, and there, uh, there uh, is difficult. Huh? There are, the, now it will be installed on LHC, uh, the triplets will be installed with, uh, with magnetic fields uh, that will be a factor 1.5 larger than than what uh, we have up to now. Huh? And uh, so this is a, a step in that direction. Everybody knows, and John was mentioning it now, that both uh, in, uh, in Europe and in China, there are discussions to produce a, 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 a tunnel 100 kilometer long, huh? where you can put m uh, magnets and um, have a collider at a factor, say, 10 in energy compared to now. On the bad side is that uh, part on distribution functions <laughs> go <laughs> against us. <laughs> so the, 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 the energy that we can explore, unfortunately, does not increase even linearly uh, with, uh, with the energy. But uh, clearly, I think that, uh, as Sandro was saying, there are two sides. One is search on the magnets. The other side is search on different acceleration, acceleration methods. Uh, there are things that happen in this field less discussed in our, in our, uh, in our usual meetings. And uh, maybe, in, uh, maybe I will see, I don't know, <laughs> collisions uh, exploring supersymmetry, as you said before. I have a, a historical reminder and then a question. Historical reminder concerning the, say, the part, next particle is uh, near to be found. I remember that uh, two decades or three decades ago, 
there was a machine built in Japan and some theoreticians suggest to build it, which is called Tristan, which is not a fortunate machine, just to look for the top at 40 GV. So people believe the top of a 40 GV, they spend money to, to find it, and we know where the top is, which is not there. So the question is, now we have found the X, the X was free to be where it has been found, but now this position for the X is such that uh, you remember that uh, supersymmetry said the, least, the X has to be uh, less than 130. And in this, indeed it is less than 130. Uh, and we know that uh, with that mass of the X it cannot be, okay, the lambda where the cutoff of standard model can, cannot go to the infinity. So is that related to your metastability and to this uh, projection that you made uh, for the uh, supersymmetry uh, range? Say this, this 130 is a lot of advertisement because, you know, of course, you know, in, in supersymmetry you can get any mass, well, not any mass, but I mean, you can really go high in mass of the Higgs as you move the supersymmetry breaking scale higher. Okay, it's a logarithmic gain, so it's a very slow gain, but you can go. Now, the whole question is a question of tuning, because after all, that was a, the motivation of supersymmetry. Uh, so I showed you the, 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 the figure uh, before, where the, oops, oops, you, you, you both, sorry. Which one? Uh, the one of the Higgs mass. So I, I, I showed you that uh, uh, in order to get to, to 130, you really have to push parameters well beyond what is justified by nature on this. So I think it's a little bit artificial. Of course, then you can always modify supersymmetry, add a singlet superfield, so that modifies the relation for the quartic and twist the story. And you know, it's important to, 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 to also to consider these variations. But the statement supersymmetry was predicting that the, the, the Higgs mass below 130 is not really exact. Supersymmetry was really predicting uh, uh, the Higgs mass well below that, but it can fit even higher masses. This is the problem, of course, of all theories that decouple, right? That you can never really exclude them. All you can do is push the limit further and further. So you see that, thank you. So you see that in order to get to 130, in this case in which you have all degenerate, even for the maximal mixing, we are talking about uh, masses of the stop that, that get close to 10 TV. All right? So one is that well beyond what you can test at the LHC. Okay? And two, they are clearly in conflict with our idea of simple naturalness. The story could be more complicated, and, uh, and, uh, and certainly if I start modifying the model, I could get... Uh, I could get the mass compatible. So I'm not claiming that the Higgs uh, discovery rules out supersymmetry, not at all, okay? But certainly puts a tremendous strain on the simplest picture. Okay, with, so with the premise, I always had a kind of a stronger version versus supersymmetry. I always had an experimental uh, kind congratulations of... Congratulations for lasting an hour and 40 minutes here in this room. <laughs> now, listening to that is always fascinating somehow because it's a, okay, it's a mixture of depressing uh, feeling and, uh, uh, if you want, uh, reassuring my motivation for my aversion somehow. And, uh, you know, I started with that when, uh, when I was a student and I was introduced uh, to supersymmetry by, by, you know, uh, by the professors back, back here in, in Padua, actually. And my aversion comes from the especially from the experimental side. So what Gigi showed, it was, it's a tremendous effort that has been done on the experimental community to try to figure out what actually to look at. I mean, you basically can have all sorts of signature and things and parameter space. You basically have to explore a parameter space with, uh, you know, uh, defined by how many degrees of freedom, freedom, 110 or so. So I never really understood why uh, on the theory community, this theory has, has been pushed forward so much. Because for me, if, if I had to think in a, let's say, with a theory hat, which I never had, by the way, would have been like, the attitude I would have would have been to go in the other direction instead of increasing the number of degrees of freedom, trying to reduce them. 
So the aversion that I had was because, you know, as an experimentalist, I was, uh, I was asked, I mean, we have been asked to explore a space which basically was multiplied by a factor of five in number of degrees of freedom. Whereas no effort has been done by this theory to explain the 24 that we have in a standard model. So this is something that I never really understood why for 40 years we've been talking about this, uh, you know, okay. this theory in a, in a fashion which is somehow pushing, I would say, in a wrong, in a wrong so, direction. So, uh, you know, and also, again, with my experiment I had, thinking about building a 100-kilometer machine, the one that Gigi is talking about, of course, it's fascinating from the technological point of view and because we know we, we need to push forward our uh, exploration of and probing of the, the energy scale. But uh, being the guiding principle, only the naturalness, is really like, you know, weakening and diminishing our motivations. So if we had something in mind that would really, you know, try to assess more fundamental things rather than, you know, uh, adding new parameters. Okay, quick, that would quickly be... to answer and then maybe also Gigi. So first of all, we have a common background because those two gentlemen, all I know about supersymmetry comes from those two gentlemen that are sitting there, okay? Uh, so it's their fault that I started supersymmetry. Uh, then uh, about uh, your complaint, I say, oh, well, you know, supersymmetry just uh, adds more parameters, adds more particles. What's this? Is this unification? Is this simplicity? I claim the opposite, okay? I mean that uh, if you were telling to Dirac, oh Dirac, you are really dumb, you just made the theory much worse, now we just had the electron, now we have the positron. I don't think you would have looked very smart because, because the point is that he made a unification, right? A conceptual unification. The fact that the, you, once you made the conceptual unification, you see this doubling of particles. It's not a doubling of particles, it's because we see it, you know, as I, as I was pointing out, in, when you look in superspace, there's no doubling, okay? There's just one entity. The problem that we see this doubling, this addition of parameters, is just because our mind is not in superspace. We are in 4D space. And once you project things out, things look more complicated. But the reality in supersymmetry, in superspace, is simpler, okay? I, I, really, I really stress this point, and so I disagree with you if you don't think so. It is one entity. It is one entity. In, at the level of supersymmetry is one entity. Then there is the issue about supersymmetry. Then we can go offline not to keep everybody. Then there is the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, the breaking of the symmetry, which is still an open issue, and we don't fully understand. Maybe one day then we will. We, we can uh, then be more predictive uh, in that terms. Um, I don't know if on the 100 TV you want to comment, uh, Gigi, on the 100 TV. Of this, uh, I'll, uh... In, in one sense, uh, I have sympathy for what Marco said, because uh, to, uh, to look under each possible stone uh, that LHC had uh, put, uh, where LHC would have, could have hidden supersymmetry has been a huge experimental effort. Uh, try to understand all the yeah, details. Yeah, but I can but, add uh, also something. I but, forgot uh, to that. No, but, uh, and, and then you can. Uh, no, you see, you say this as a disadvantage. Oh, look, you really complicated the life of experimental. I think very often when theorists uh, uh, suggest the weird particles, independently of what they are, just the fact that forces you to think of completely different uh, signatures, forces you to redesign your triggers in order to take care of the uh, stable gluino and so on. I think it enriches the searches because, look, if you're looking only for the Higgs boson and nothing else, okay, game closed, right? So I think that the role of theories is also to suggest new ways to use. You have this beautiful jewel of the Chisio detector. You want to exploit it till the end. You may have missed many things if you design the trigger just to see the simplest thing and nothing else. Many of these uh, ideas helped, I think, but you can tell me if, I, if you agree. No, I agree with you. Experimentalists to look, to think orthogonally to the simplest searches that you had in mind at the very beginning. No, no, I mean, I, I, I was going exactly in that direction because uh, clearly uh, looking for something special as the things that I have shown today, uh, looking for uh, particles that stop inside the detector or that uh, a jet that, that originates after 20 centimeters is a, 
uh, is open a new space. I mean, maybe we have no, they have not found uh, supersymmetry, but we know that there are no long living particles in, in any form produced by the, the LHC. So it's a, it's a, 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 a researches that were motivated per se, in my opinion. And the thing is that, that very often people say, well, something is more complicated, so what did you gain? I mean, when quantum mechanics came, is quantum mechanics simpler than classical mechanics? I don't think so, right? Even that's one parameter, h bar, right? <laughs> so uh, we have to be careful on one saying what is simpler. And you, I think one is to see how far you can go in the conceptual understanding of nature. Certainly, I mean, in the case of supersymmetry, the, case, the, the, the picture is not completely clear. There are lots of uh, uh, dark corners of unexplained, it's, and we could, we could discuss. But clearly, the goal is to go towards a deeper understanding of nature. If maybe the goal has failed, but I can assure you that that is a goal uh, in the mind of people who have pursued this attempt. Just another question. Uh, what remains of uh, the prediction of supersymmetry? If supersymmetry is not at uh, low energy scale, but at high energy, what is uh, what gives good about? Uh, uh, then, uh, then it opens a whole new story. For me, then the only handles will be uh, things like the Higgs mass and dark matter. And actually, uh, if you put them to maybe, maybe gauge coupling unification, you can also rescue that. If you go there, you go in the direction of scenarios of, of split supersymmetry that we could enter, that I think they have several virtues in my opinion. So if, if I don't see any, any more questions, so let's thank the two speakers for these wonderful talks.